Good evening. I wonder how many of us realize that it was less than 100 years ago that the first successful sounding of a deep ocean was made. And actually, the science of oceanography itself is a little older than our, old than our own century. Actually, of course, that's a very small amount of time in the life of the sea, where time is normally calculated in terms of hundreds of millions of years. The reason for this, of course, was that before we could explore this vast underwater world, adequate methods had to be developed. And it's only within recent years that science has been able to make these methods and techniques available. Now, the sleek craft that you see here represents a milestone in the short history of marine research. This is the Danish scientific ship, Galatea, as she put into Treasure Island last month on her way home from a two-year round-the-world expedition in which scientists from many nations have been taking part. Among the four American scientists invited to join the expedition was Dr. Rolf Boleyn, professor of marine biology at Stanford University, who was here being greeted by our own Dr. Robert C. Miller, director of the academy. Dr. Boleyn is the assistant director at Hopkins Marine Station down at Pacific Grove and is one of the world authorities on marine life. And so we're quite fortunate in having him here with us this evening as our guest scientist. Welcome to Science in Action, Dr. Boleyn. Thanks, Earl. I suppose I should mention that it wasn't so many years ago that uh, I was a student and you were my major professor. And here, for the first time, it's quite a treat for me to be able to ask you the question. Your chance to turn the tables on me, eh? Well, I guess that's fair enough. How does it feel to be back uh, on dry land again after your three-month cruise on the Galatea, during which you worked over some of the deepest parts of the ocean? Well, I haven't had much chance to lose my sea legs. You see, we go out twice a week on our own little survey boat down at the station. Well, twice a week. Now, is that in connection with some special project that you have there? Yes, we're doing a study for the Office of Naval Research on hydrographic conditions and how these affect spawning. And we're also doing a continuing study on these factors and how they influence the California sardine. Well, the sardine industry, of course, in Monterey is quite large one, is it not? Yes. And the reason it is are the very reasons that make those waters so intriguing to us. You see, the continental shelf is very narrow down there, and we have about a mile of water within some five miles of shore. Now, the steep slope causes the deep ocean currents, which are rich in nutrients, to be deflected toward the surface and makes the whole area extremely fertile and rich in all forms of marine life. Well, I think we should stop a moment right here, Dr. Boleyn, to explain what you mean by the words of continental shelf. Yes, it's pretty important to know the three main types of ocean topography. The continental shelf, the continental slope, and the oceanic abyss. Now, I think this chart will help us to get the idea. It's a condensed cross-section of the Pacific with our own west coast represented here. As we go outward, we find the Hawaiian Islands and still farther out the Philippines, while at the far extreme left is the coast of China. Now, as the seabed slopes away from the continent, it declines gradually for several miles offshore, usually to a depth of around 100 fathoms, that's 600 feet. We call this a continental shelf. Along the Pacific coast, the shelf ranges from 5 to 20 miles in width, but in some parts of the world, you may find a shelf as wide as 800 miles. But beyond the 100 fathom line, the bottom slopes off very suddenly in a steep decline toward the sea floor. This is the continental slope, and it generally runs down to around 6,000 feet. Beyond that, we have the sea floor or the oceanic abyss, which is a better term because it actually bears very little resemblance to a floor. This extreme dip way over here represents what's recognized to date as the deepest ocean hole. It's the Mindanao Trench off the Philippines. Well, let's see, uh, that's a little bit more than 34,000 feet, isn't it? Yes, or about six and a half miles. Well, that's farther down in the ocean than any mountain peak rises above the surface of the earth. Imagine being uh, covered by that much water. Yes, one of the questions that the Galatea was concerned with was whether any life at all could exist at those depths. Well, we want to ask you about that, Dr. Boleyn, but first tell us, uh, how do you go about exploring depths such as these? Obviously, you can't go over the side in a diving suit. Well, hardly. A man in a diving suit can't go more than about 500 feet. But, you see... 
underwater pressure increases about one atmosphere for every 33 feet. Now, an atmosphere is 15 pounds per square inch. So if we go down 500 feet, we already have a pressure of about 200 pounds. If we go down 33,000 feet, we have a thousand times the pressure at the surface, or about seven and a half tons per square inch. But then there are other equally forbidding factors about the deep. Light doesn't penetrate effectively more than about 500 feet. And if we go down, say, 60 times that much, there, well, there just never has been any light. There's nothing but utmost darkness for the past million years. And then, of course, there's the problem of temperature. Well, without the warmth of the sun, it must uh, become extremely cold down there. Yes, it gets gradually colder until at a depth of, say, 10,000 feet, it's only a couple of degrees above freezing. Well, that explains why we've had to find other ways of exploring the deeps uh, rather than go down ourselves. Incidentally, how would you find out whether there was life, say, at uh, 34,000 feet? Well, before we go down that deep, I think it would help a little if we discuss some of the fundamentals of oceanography. Why not come aboard our own survey boat by way of fill? Let us show you some of the equipment we use and what we look for. <coughs> now, this is the Taga, Stanford Marine Station's 40-foot boat. She's not as large and luxurious as the Galatea, and I must say considerably less stable in a rough sea, but she's rigged for the same type of work on a smaller scale. We can test for temperature, measure light penetration, take water samples, as well as biological specimens. Here, for instance, a set of water bottles is being sent down to 3,300 feet. We call them bottles, or they're actually 20-inch tubes made of Monell metal. We take samples regularly to determine the variations in the salt, oxygen, phosphate, and silicate content of the water. Well, I noticed that you dropped a little metal gadget down uh, after you put the bottle down. Is that the way that you close those uh, cylinders after uh, they have taken their sample? Yes, that's a pretty cute device. If you want to come over here, I'll show you how it works. You see, these bottles are strung on the line in very much the same way that they are when we send them over the side. The bottle is sent down open on each end so that the water can get in, and as we pass, uh, or as we trip the bottle, the thermometer records the temperature. This is done by dropping a weight, and in a moment here I'll drop the weight. Now watch what happens. <laughs> Boy, that's uh, certainly a very tricky way of doing it. I see these bottles have been thoroughly closed now. That's really all right. Incidentally, Dr. Bully, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was the, uh, some of the tests that you make for light penetration. I'm just wondering now, what value do these light tests uh, have when you know that light only goes down to, oh, maybe a few hundred feet? Oh, well, there's a considerable variation in the penetration of light, after all, based on a number of factors. For instance, if there's a heavy concentration of phytoplankton, plant plankton, that is, near the surface, this will act as a filter and cut out the light from penetrating much deeper. And, of course, we want to know these things. Well, I was wondering when plankton uh, would enter our story. Actually, of course, uh, plankton from the Greek word meaning uh, wandering it refers to the vast amount of animal and plant life that exists in suspension in the sea from near the surface where it occurs in greatest concentration down to the deepest hole. The plankton simply floats with the currents and lives its entire cycle without ever touching the bottom. The plankton is one of the greatest marvels of the sea. Many of the hundreds of thousands of organisms that compose it occur in ima unimaginable numbers. Millions of microscopic plant cells may occur in a single cubic inch of water. And frequently these organisms are so common that they color the ocean brick red for hundreds of square miles. Also, if you realize that in the depths there live small forms in such numbers that they may form a layer so dense that they reflect the sound waves that are used in echo sounding and give a false impression of a bottom only part way down, then you get some idea of the staggering productivity of the sea. Well, this must make the ocean a tremendous potential resource for food. Well, that's what we're hoping to find out. And here is one of the instruments that we use to study that particular problem. It looks to me like a very well-made uh, plankton net. Yes, this is a plankton net which, when stretched out, will 
measure about 15 feet in length. It's made of building silk imported from Switzerland and is a rather expensive piece of equipment. Very nice. But uh, let's go aboard the Toggy again and see how plankton uh, samples are made. Here the net is being hauled in from deep water and in a few minutes we'll show you a catch which came up from very considerable depth indeed. <coughs> now, when you see how many different animals are floating in this small scoopful of plankton, you can perhaps imagine how infinite is the number of these creatures distributed throughout our seas. There are tens of thousands of them right here. That large umbrella-like bubble is a small jellyfish who is almost completely transparent. Well, here's another one here, and this is a shrimp. It's about an inch and a half long and brilliant red in color. And there it is up against the side of the tank. Now, this one is called a snailfish for very obvious reasons. And both of these organisms are from about 1,500 feet. Uh, this fellow is quite remarkable. He's also a form of crustacean, as you can see from his inner body, but that barrel he surrounds himself with is something he's stolen from another animal, a salp or a pelagic sea squirt. He demolishes the rest of the animal, animal and makes himself a shelter of this cellulose-like material, which is its shell. To me, the most amazing part is that a thing can be that transparent and actually live. It does seem incredible, and all the more so when we remember that these organisms are from a quarter of a mile on down, where the light is practically non-existent and where the pressure is extremely severe. Well, I have something here that'll indicate just how severe the pressure is, and even before you get down to a depth of 1,500 uh, feet. I told you that it was important to send these water bottles down open, and that's not just simply because it's the easiest way to fill them. I made the rather expensive mistake of sending this one down close to a thousand feet, and that's the way it came back. <laughs> oh, boy, look at that. That's made out of heavy metal, too. Now, that reminds me of the story that Dr. William Beebe told at the time he was going down half mile into the ocean with his famous bathysphere or diving bell. He said, well, now, actually, he said, I'm in no danger of being drowned, because if the diving bell does spring a leak, those droplets of water, as they come into the bell, will have the same effect as though they were rifle bullets and would pass through me immediately. Well, looking at this, I can certainly see what he had in mind. Well, of course, we should bear in mind, too, that <laughs> pressure doesn't have the same effect on deep-sea organisms that it did on this bottle, for the primary reason that their tissues are so watery that the pressure inside is practically the same as that outside. Well, that would be the same principle, then, as filling a balloon full of water and sending it down to the ocean, and, of course, There'd be a very little change in the balloon because water is almost totally incompressible. But let's take that same balloon and fill it with air and send it down, and uh, it would look worse than this water bottle that we just looked at a minute ago. Well, that's right, but a far more serious problem than pressure in the depth is the problem of food. Now, all animals depend on plant life originally. This means that all food originates up here, where it is light. From here, it filters down through the various layers of inorganic life to form, in the form of partly digested food, decomposed remains of upper layer animals, or animals themselves who are prey to other plankton hunters. As you reach the greater depths, where it's more and more difficult to find food, you begin to find more weird and grotesque creatures like this specimen. This is a gopher eel. You see, it consists mainly of uh, just a tremendous mouth which is being propelled through the water by a long tail. One can hardly conceive of a more effective plankton trap or food, food gathering machine. This is a viper fish that fights his food battles by means of these long teeth. Just see how long they are. He has a set of dental equipment that would shame a saber-toothed tiger. And here is a little fellow, a member of the anglerfish group that has a very fancy lure. It's in the form of a fishing pole here on top of his head. On the end of the pole is a light which he flashes on and off to attract his prey. And when they come in front of him, he 
takes them in this oversized mouth of his. Well, Dr. Boleyn, uh, all of these very interesting fishes are from quite deep water, are they not? Well, we used to consider them as deep sea fishes, but since I've been aboard the Galatea, I almost consider them to be surface forms. Well, I see. Well, now, you've mentioned uh, previously the <coughs> depth of 15,000 feet. Uh, just how far down can a fish live in the ocean? Well, I'd say 18,000 feet is about the normal limit, but the Galatea did get one from 24,000 feet. Now, most of the deep sea fishes are small, pale in color, feeble, with poorly developed eyes, or some of them are eyeless, like this fellow you see here. Beyond 18,000 feet, their feeding uh, is pretty slim for fishes and life beyond that point is chiefly invertebrate. Here's an 18,000-foot catch being hauled aboard the Galatea. You can see that it consists mostly of sea cucumbers, squids, sea urchins, and crustaceans. Well, these uh, organisms were all dead when you brought them up. You weren't able to bring any of them up alive, were you, Dr. No, Taylor? not from these depths, of course. Uh, but contrary to the general opinion, they, they perish not so much from changes in temperature, as from changes in, or not so much from changes in pressure as from changes in temperature. You have to remember that it's just glacially cold down there. <laughs> now, they were able to bring up living bacteria from the depths of the Mindanao Trench, but these were the only living form. Well, there were evidences of animal life in that deepest of all ocean trenches, were there not, was there not? Oh, yes. In fact, there were several, seven different varieties. Now, all of the actual specimens are still on board the Galatea, but this little sea anemone that you see here was one of the animals that came from these depths. And no animal has ever been taken from deeper water than this one. Others were sea worms and several different forms of crustacea. Well, it's certainly awe-inspiring to think of these creatures living their entire lives in this frigid silence, where there's never been any light and no passage of time as we know it. Well, it's black, all right, and I'll admit it's cold, but it's not as silent in the sea as we used to think. We found that out during the war when the Navy had powerful listening gear out to spot ship movements. And they found out that the sea was a pretty noisy place after all. Would you like to hear some recordings made by the Office of Naval Research of some of these sounds they picked up? Sure, let's have them. All right. Now... <coughs> Here is one. Listen. Sounds like flames crackling, doesn't it? It's actually thousands of tiny shrimps snapping their claws together. And that booping sound that you hear in the background, well, that's a toadfish. Now, here's another. I recognize that. Those are cokers. Of course, we have some of those in Steinhardt Aquarium, but we don't get much noise from them except at feeding time. I must say, though, that the first person to hear that on his listening post must have received a terrific supply. <laughs> now, here's my favorite. Can you guess what this is? Oh, I have a, I have a pretty good idea, but uh, it'd be better if you told it. Well, this sound is made by a school of porpoises, those playful, friendly mammals that many of you probably have seen in our own local waters. Lots of other sounds have been recorded, but many of them are still to be determined. Well, that's just one more of the many unknown quantities that makes uh, sea exploration such a tantalizing field for work. Now, let's see. We've uh, looked at some of the animals that live the deepest in the ocean, some of the smallest animals, but there's still one thing that we haven't looked into. Oh, yeah? Well, how about these uh, legendary stories we hear about the sea serpents? Well, that's a mystery we may be on the verge of solving. I suppose you're thinking of the giant seal larva, or uh, eel larva that was discovered some time ago. Yes, uh, that was what I had in mind. Now, uh, just what is the story on that? Well, we can put it this way. The larva of the normal Atlantic eel is a little fellow about four inches in length. Now, this form grows up into an adult eel that has a length of four or five feet. Off 
Africa and again in the Bay of Panama, there was discovered an eel larva that had a length of something over six feet. The question is, what size does this eel grow into? If the four-inch specimen can grow into an eel that's four or five feet long, the six-foot eel grows into one. Of course, we have to realize that there are variations in the size of offspring and variations in rate of growth, but allowing for these things, the adult that grows from this large six-foot eel larva can't be less than 30 or 40 feet long, and it might well be 90 feet or even more. Well, has this uh, mature eel ever been sighted by anyone? That is by a reliable source, of course. Well, no, not yet. But I think that's just a matter of time. In fact, the Galatea is fishing for it right now in the Bay of Panama. They're using long lines and big hooks. Well, in other words, any day we might uh, perhaps pick up our newspaper and find, perhaps even tomorrow morning, that uh, a famous sea monster has at last been captured. Well, who can tell? We may. <laughs> Well, meanwhile, whether she gets her sea serpent or not, the Galatea has uh, written her part in oceanographic history because she has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that life exists in the deepest parts of the ocean. We also know that the sea is as productive, acre for acre, as rich farmland. With population pressures increasing all over the world as they are, this is important. We're going to have to find other sources of food before too long, and these studies that we are making bring us closer to an understanding of the sea's great potential and of how it may someday be utilized. Well, thanks to you, Dr. Boleyn, we've had an insight tonight into some of these newer methods uh, in use in oceanography in the present time. And we hope that when you complete your work down at Monterey, that you will come back sometime in the future and give us the sequel to this story. Thanks for being with us on Science in Action. Our animal of the week is a, a seven-month-old house pet of a type that I'm certain that you've never seen before in a house. Mr. Van Beerbomber has been training this animal, and uh, tell me now, uh, what, is, uh, what is your youngster's name, uh, Van? Uh, the Siski is the mountain lion's name, and he was named by uh, Casey Ward, who writes a column, So We Hear, in Berkeley, oh, yes. in can, the Berkeley uh, Gazette. Can, can you show us the... Uh, the uh, I'm a little bit, uh, not very much up on handling claws. mountain lions or right American now. cougars. Let's see, what, uh, what does Siski weigh now? He weighs 73 pounds. 73, and uh, full grown, uh, going to be about what? Well, he should hit about 165, 170. Uh -huh. And if you notice, his claws are... Good. Good. I, I understand that when, uh, when Siski plays, he keeps the claws back in, is that right? Yes, he does. <laughs> Quite a character. Right? It's pretty rough on the furniture. Yes, yeah, so how do you keep any furniture in your house? <laughs> well, they, they've got to be renewed every once in a while, but he does a good job. I know you have uh, something in your pocket there for Siski. Suppose we uh, see what Siski this does. Is the uh, only the time that we don't fool with him too much is around eating time. <clears throat> Money, uh... Well, Siski seems to be really interested in that food. I'm, uh, I'm glad my hand wasn't down there at the time. <laughs> Plays a lot like a dog or a cat. Uh -huh. The only thing is. Uh, when he does get something, it's his. You don't get it back until he gets through with it. Yes. Now, uh, how long are you going to be able to keep Siski, this uh, mountain lion or American well, cougar, as a pet? Well, I hope to keep him as long as I possibly can. In three weeks, he goes to Hollywood. He's going to make a, in a picture. I can't give the name because I was asked yes. not to release the name. Well, Siski is really growing. That's a, that's a wonderful animal. They have an extremely long tail. Well, Siski seems to have uh, seems to have finished all that. Uh, now he'd be perfectly all right. You could handle him again without yeah. any trouble at all. Yeah. Uh -huh. The only thing is, don't try to take his food away from him. No, I, I would never do that. I can assure you of that. Now this <laughs> white collar is not is not because he's mean. He has such terrific power and pull. Yes. He can pull this, all he can pull, what two Great Danes or two St. Bernards could pull. Yes, well, Van, I That's want to thank uh, you for bringing Siski over to Science and Action. It's certainly been a pleasure right, to see this, pleasure uh, to come. this uh, mountain lion on our uh, program. All right, thank you. Now, just a word about our next program. I have something here that will interest every youngster. <clears throat> have you ever tried to throw a curved ball? You know, there's quite a technique to it. You pick up a ball, a baseball, and you start to throw a curve, and if you are successful, you have applied Bernoulli's principle. Now, Bernoulli's principle comes under the field of fluid dynamics. On our next program, Dr. Harvey White of the University of California will be with us 
to tell us about Bernoulli's principle and fluid dynamics. We hope you'll plan to be with us then. Thanks a lot.